Welcome, everybody, to a special presentation of Local Film Talk. I'm Bob Walters of Triangle Life TV, and this is an episode from our continuing coverage of the 10th Annual Carborough Film Festival. In this episode, director Patrick Reed Johnson screened uh, a preview version of his upcoming independent film, 52577. Uh, now, that title is a date, a date that some of you may be familiar with, um, Mr. Johnson's been working on this film for over a decade, I believe, and it's finally in the final stages uh, before an actual release. He's only showed it to a couple different people, and the Carborough Film Festival was one of those first audiences, and actually this was the first time this particular cut had been screened. Um, a little more on that later, but I just want to give a big thanks to Mr. Johnson for showing this film at the Carborough Film Festival, and then afterwards, uh, the content of this episode is his Q&A with local filmmaker Michael Howard, who you may recognize from several of our other episodes. So, um, just a little heads up for you sharp-eyed viewers out there, you may notice that when the episode begins... There's some credits rolling in what looks like a premiere timeline, and that is in fact a premiere timeline. Uh, Mr. Johnson had been working on a new cut of the film and was having trouble getting it to render out, so we actually watched the movie inside Adobe Premiere, which was, I gotta say, a pretty unique experience. Um, but I only bring that up because he mentions that a few times throughout the episode. I just wanted you to know what he was talking about Um you know, his final render um, was giving him trouble, and it took him a few minutes to, um, you know, figure out he was just going to have to open up Premiere and show us the movie that way. So when he's referencing uh, making the audience wait and showing it uh, to people inside Premiere, that's what he's talking about. I, uh, I wouldn't say it took anything away from the movie. It was still a lot of fun to watch, um, really cool, and I can't wait for this film to get out and for everybody to be able to see it. So, um before we get started, I just want to take a second to thank, again, Mr. Johnson for showing this movie and doing the Q&A. Uh, also thank uh, our friend Michael Howard for conducting the Q&A. And, of course, Festival Director Nick Beery, the Carborough Film Festival, and the Carborough Arts Center for putting on an awesome event and letting us put it out for an episode for you guys to enjoy. So, thank you to everyone for making this possible. And without further ado, here's Michael Howard and Patrick Reed Johnson talking about uh, Mr. Johnson's upcoming independent film, 52577. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> that was one of the best responses ever. So maybe we did something right by making you wait an hour. <laughs> I really apologize for that, but... I, it was really important to me that you see the opening um, 10 minutes that's radically different than it ever was before. Um, the whole um, sort of flashback into his childhood and what he did, you know, well, while his parents were arguing and while he was building the models and trying to keep his family together with movies, as, as Donnie points out at the, at the hospital scene, to resonate against that scene. We never had all of that at the beginning of the movie at all. It just started sort of present day, went back for a moment to 2001 and then came back to present day. And I just really wanted to try it out with you guys. So hopefully the first 10 minutes was okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hello, I'll stop. That's why I actually asked for a moderator because just like my character, um, um, I tend to go on. So yeah. gotcha. I'll cut you off. Interrupt right there. all the time. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations. I mean, this has obviously been a long time in the running, about 10 years now um, to get to this point, and you're still working on it, but I think it's at about where you want it to be, correct? It's, it's very close. There, and, you know, as we were mucking around over there, I was, there was a lot of stuff that's actually changed from the, the last, you know, section of the movie that was kind of smaller in scale. Uh, the, the, every, in fact, everything after, you know, the swimming pool with full of shark debris and uh, <laughs> bodies uh, is, is somewhat different now. Um, and, and I'd be happy to come back and show it, show it again when we get a little more together. Uh, but it was in pieces, and those pieces, as I was trying to pull them together last night, erupted in a bit of an explosion of technological <laughs> mayhem. And I thought, I'd rather have something s at least semi-stable to show you guys. Um, 
but I'm, you know, I'm, we can discuss some of the differences as we go through it. But yeah, definitely. Let's take it back to the beginning. What um, I mean, before you got into this, you were, you know, were obviously making pretty large films as well with Angus and Spaced Invaders and having people behind you and kind of bringing you forward that were well established in the industry. So how was that coming up with that that led into this um, well, it's, as you started that? It's funny because this, I've made four or five, well, movies and this is my first film. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you've seen any of the other Spaced Invaders, which got me started because Steven Spielberg liked it so much, but it's, it's a goofy, as one reviewer called it, willfully cheesy sci-fi comedy. And it was willfully cheesy. We knew we didn't have enough money to do something really good, so we did something funny and awful. <laughs> and Steven liked it, and Kathy Kennedy liked it, and they got it put in theaters. And then I developed all kinds of things, you know, including Dragonheart, which was originally going to be, you know, Sean Connery, Liam Neeson, Kenneth Branagh, Elizabeth Hurley, Jerry Goldsmith, me, directing, and they didn't believe in Liam Neeson. This was before Schindler's List, and they were like, he's never going to amount to anything. <laughs> and I was like, okay, if I'm not doing, and Liam and I were friends, we were developing the movie together, and I said, if, if Liam's not doing it, I'm not doing it. And they said, okay, here's your check. You know, wow. so it bounced off my own film. So then, you know, I, I was ready to quit Hollywood then, but then I was offered Angus. And I really, no, I'm sorry, then I was offered Baby's Day Out, which was, <laughs> Baby's Day Out was one of those things that I, because I had a, a background in visual effects, because I ended up going to work for people like Douglas Trumbull um, when I got to Hollywood to pay the bills. I was a model maker in his model shop. And then one day, you know, and then I, at the same time, I, was, I sold my first script when I was 19 to 20th Century Fox. And so I had this kind of dual career of a visual effects artist, screenwriter, but none of that was directing. So finally, eight years into it, I, I kind of sat around and thought, God, I know all these great people. You know, anyone ever heard of John Knoll? Yeah. Okay, best man at my wedding. My, I was best man at his. Uh, we grew up together as model makers, working for guys like Doug Trumbull. And we thought, I got to, with him, and I said, and this is the guy who, if you don't know him, he now runs Lucasfilm's Industrial Light and Magic and is the producer of Star Wars Rogue One, and also wrote the story for it. Uh, he also wrote this little program, it's an obscure little uh, program called Photoshop. And <clears throat> so anyway, he's, he's doing fine. But, uh, and he worked on quite a number of things in this film. Everything in LA, the cloud tank sequence in the Close Encounters model shop, and uh, the, uh, the Death Star trench, uh, that whole Death Star trench surface wasn't even there. There was just the square that he picked up, the rest John put in. Wow. And the Millennium Falcon wasn't there, he put it in for us. But anyway, we just got together one day when we were kind of bouncing around. He was still doing visual effects, and he, was just up at, he had just gotten a job at ILM. And I was kind of spinning my wheels, writing and selling scripts, and making a lot of money building models for in, in the 80s, you know? <clears throat> it was a big time for visual effects, for physical visual, visual effects. So I suddenly... One day, I was just sitting around, and I said, I, gotta, I've got, I came out here to direct a movie. I've got to do something. So I called John, and I called my writing partner, Scott Alexander, and, we, and a couple other friends, and we got together, and, we, and, I, and I said, you know what? I've, you, ever, you ever see The Russians Are Coming? The Russians Are Coming? Okay, great, great movie. One of my childhood favorites. And I thought, what, how could I do a version of that? And I also always wanted to do something around War of the Worlds. And I thought, well, wait a minute. What happens to the wackiest ship in the Atomic Space Navy when the, guy, you know, the, the, the guys way out in the asteroid field who are put out there because they're too dangerous to allow into the actual war uh, with our tourists overhear a 50th anniversary rebroadcast of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and go, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, what? what? What invasion? What are you talking about? You know, they head to Earth following a signal to this little podunk town in Illinois that's doing it on Halloween night. And they're little green men with antennae who can't get arrested because their weapons don't work and no one takes them seriously. You think and it's it, Halloween. You yeah, and so we came them. up with this story. We wrote it real quick, and then we created this sort of circus of materials, you know, miniatures and little sculpts of the Martians. And, you know, we kind of created a kind of turnkey movie and walked in to all the major studios, and they all said, you can't do this for anything less than $15 million. Disney was going to buy it off. They said, well, this is a great script, but we'll only do it as Ernest meets the Martians. You know, hmm. remember the Ernest series. And I was like, I'm not going to... Because we were going after DeForest Kelly as the old man in the movie at that point. So anyway, so we, we said, no, we're going to do this independently. And finally, we found a guy, this crazy Italian producer, who said he'd give us $1.75 million. We thought we needed 2.5. And he said, who do you think you are? I give you 1.75. Nobody else is going to give you a million dollars. You take it or leave it. And I sat up yeah, all night it. wondering. So, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so and we made the movie, and the rest is sort of history. So. Nice. 
Well, so sticking with this one, I mean, you look at it now that this is a movie about you and, you know, where you were kind of coming to age with that. And then you made the movie, and now, 10 years later, you're looking back at this different version of you who made a movie about a version of you. So, <laughs> it's getting pretty meta. Yeah, how are you, well, how do let, you feel about this now, looking back at that? Well, let versions? me preface this by saying, nobody was pining for the Patrick Reed Johnson story. I knew that. <laughs> I, there wasn't, it wasn't like, when are they going to tell that tale? Nobody really knows who I am, which is why the credit is saved for the end, because unless you've really paid attention to this, you're just wandering in off the streets to keep warm in the movie theater. You're going you're gonna to see this movie and not know who the director is until the last shot, you know. Uh, or the first shot of the credits. Uh, and it gets, for people who don't know, there's this huge sort of, whoa, you know, because they don't expect it. And even on the posters, I don't know, if, did you have any of those up? Or we, our poster actually is kind of this old aged, wrinkly, folded up thing that's been, that looks like it's been around for 10 years. And it actually, it's got little rips and tears on it. And part of the, the bottom right corner of all the posters is torn off so that you can see, you can only see directed, but, <laughs> <laughs> and you can't see the name. So we're, we'll, we'll actually be pulling the, the fact that it's my story way back. And the only reason it stayed my story and not some fictional character was because of all the people that are portrayed in the movie, like Steven and, and John Dykstra and the various, and the, some of the living friends and relatives and stuff. If for any reason any of them objected to a fictional portrayal, they could stop it. But it's my story. And I mean, like, Steven will like it, and George has already seen it, and he likes it. it I had to make sure that I, I could portray everything I wanted to portray without having to secure rights in, in a different way. Yeah. Uh, because, and, and, the, and it's much more amazing that it's a true story about a real person. If you wrote this story about a fictional character, no one would ever believe it. They wouldn't believe it, because it's too crazy. In fact, the craziest stuff that happens in this movie is the truest stuff. Remember what it said at the beginning, most of this is true, the rest is even truer? Uh, <laughs> Almost everything in this film happened pretty much the way it happened. It didn't all happen in exactly that order, and it actually took a couple of years, not just like six months or whatever. And, and, and things were moved around in transitional material, but the dialogue is word for word the stuff my friends and I said. I mean, literally, word for word. Nice. So, well, and everything in Hollywood is dead on, exactly as it happened. Yeah, and it's a love story with imagination and filmmaking and all of that, so I can't imagine that them seeing this would suddenly be like, oh, I don't like the no. way I was portrayed and, there. Well, the other thing, look, I mean, it's obviously pretty meta in terms of its observation of itself, even. I mean, mm -hmm. it starts with the slate, you know, c coming in and, or being removed, and we sort of come out of our filmmaking awareness and into yeah, his the world. aspect ratio, even. And there's a transitional thing that's going on in the new cut that you haven't seen yet, the later stuff, where he's he's winding through this sort of movie of his life later in, you know, that when, he, when he rewinds, he rewinds it. it. The, the film is actually told from the point of view of that moment. Then he's sort of winding through this little moviola and, and the, there's real footage and then there's the imaginary moments and they're all sort of projected into that. Um, so there's a lot of editorial risk that I've been taking with this film. And you know, some people like it, some people are like, whoa. <laughs> um, it's a little, this particular version that you're seeing right now, that, that, like I said, the later part of the movie that I had to sort of go back to a backup plan for you for today, is a little overcut for my taste. It's, it, there's many moments where there's way too many cuts per, per minute. I'm not a Michael Bay fan, so I don't, <laughs> I mean, I really do like to linger. I'm much more, I would rather cook, cut like Kubrick if I could. Yes. Wadsworth, Illinois, <laughs> population 750. <laughs> it's still there. What's that? You really had an Asian girlfriend? I really had a half Asian girlfriend, yeah. How I did. How did she like it? She loved it. She, she's actually just saw it for the first time two years ago. Two, two, about two years ago. And she sat right next to me with her, like her niece or something. And she was, she was moved. I mean, she, she'd known about it. She was actually involved in casting Emmy Chen. Uh, to play her, she was she she was there at the casting sessions, and um, <clears throat> thank you. Well, I think that really helps. I really do. I, I did, you know I, I I want it to feel real. I tell you, I get I get emails and postings on my website and on Facebook and stuff from people who've seen the trailer or the film at different festivals, and especially the trailer, like which is a worldwide reach already and has for years and it's a very wonderful trailer cut by a guy named Seth Gavin who cut Space Invaders for me who now owns the best trailer company in town who's doing all the new Star Wars trailers and everything. these guys are amazing and he um, but anyway the um, where the hell was I going with that <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'd go on um, what was it what were we on to somebody help me out Emmy Chen talking about uh, what's that casting yeah, there was something else about the trailer. Uh, uh, oh, the trailer. Oh, so, okay, so I'm getting, I get emails. 
from all over the planet, from people in like Lapland and Buenos Aires and, and Tokyo and you know South Africa, saying, "How do you? How did you know what it's like to be a teenager where I live?" And I said, "I don't know what it's like to be a teenager where you live. I know what it's like to be a teenager." Uh, and, and it seems to be fairly universal. And I think by sticking as close to... Look, I didn't paint this guy as some stainless wonder kid who's just wonderful, he's all, always nice and cool. He's kind of an asshole sometimes, <laughs> as teenagers can be. Yeah. Um, but, and I also felt like, you know, you said making a movie about myself. I actually don't feel like I'm making a movie about myself when I, when I, when I was directing this or even writing it. And, and on set, I never said, oh, I would never do that. Or this is... I, I actually thought I was making a movie about 17-year-old Pat Johnson, who quantum mechanically still lives back in 1977 and would be mortified to meet me <laughs> and, 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 had, and deserved a proper treatment. So I had to treat him as a separate character. And, I, and I, I'd worked that way, and I didn't want to kind of lord over the fact that it was my story over my crew and my cast, or especially John Francis Daly. I wanted it to be about this guy, this young guy, so we could be true to that, not true to who I am now. So mm -hmm. that, it was helpful. Um, you know, it's taken a great deal of time. Well, I'm sure we'll get into why in a minute, but um, one of the things that all this time has allowed is for me to mature to the place where I could play my own father in the first 10 minutes of the movie. My daughter actually plays me in the 2001 scene as a little blonde-haired kid. That's actually my daughter with her hair cut off and dyed blonde in boy clothes. Boy, she almost haven't, has never forgiven me for that. But, um, but to play my own father was a real cleansing experience, and it really helps for me, and maybe I hope for the audience, kind of have this turnaround of, of, of reality, you know, to get that yeah. meta thing going. And that's what I was wondering, too, because, you know, there's, there's different ways you can look at the film. Is this therapeutic for you to have made the film, or were you already at a good place, and now you're kind of writing about the 17 version and what he went through and kind of finding these aspects of his life in the film? Yeah, it's weird. It, there is no question this was therapeutic, and maybe part of it... Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't take 10 years, well, actually 11 now, and it'll be probably 12 by the time it hits theaters. Um, between 11 and 12, somewhere in there. Boyhood. <laughs> <laughs> Amateurs. No, the only reason I, I took this long to do it was I heard that Boyhood was going into production. I was like, I'll, I'll wait yeah, out. I'll beat them, them out by a yeah. year. <laughs> no. No, the truth of the matter is this movie was actually written in anticipation of being filmed in time to come out like three weeks ahead of episode one. Okay. Because everybody was excited. We were all thinking, wow, this is going to be yeah, amazing and bad. what a time. <laughs> so we would have come out, you know, and then that thing came out and I was like, oh my God, I don't want my movie anywhere near that. Plus, <laughs> suddenly the popularity is not so much. And, and then, you know, and Fanboys came out and by the time the, the three prequels had come out and Fanboys had come out, we literally had distributors who would look at the cut of the film and say, this is really a good movie. There's a nice movie here. It's too bad Star Wars is over. <laughs> and they meant it. And I was like, and, and unfortunately, I knew things that I could not repeat even to save my movie. I knew that there was, at the time, there was going to be a TV series. A resurgence, too. And I also knew that they were planning on a 7, 8, and 9 eventually. But when I actually found out for real that it was happening, I couldn't even say it then because I would have been excommunicated. You know what I mean? And my, my, some of my very good friends would have never spoken to me again. And I could, it, would, it really would have been, it probably would have brought down a hammer on the film too. So for, there was this period where the film was just, we were working on it and we were showing it and we were hoping that some brave distributor would say, who cares if no one's ever going to see another Star Wars film? It's still a good story. We even at one point talked about cutting Star Wars out of it and just doing the Close Encounters thing. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> but, no. Obviously we're not going to do that. But... And in, in some ways, I mean, the movie certainly isn't about Star Wars, okay? It's not about that. It's about growing up. It's about following some sort of dream that, that draws you away from your comfort level mm -hmm. from the, into the kind of undiscovered country of the, over the horizon. And, and, and it, you know, it's kind of a combination of American graffiti and, for me, um, for me, it was my Angus meets American graffiti kind of thing. Um, but... But finally, then one, all of a sudden, when it got announced that there was going to be an episode seven, suddenly all these distributors were calling, going, <clears throat> yeah, I know, maybe you don't remember us. Oh, I remember you. You said no. And they were all like, um, can we just take another quick peek? You know? But, of course, they saw it. And they're like, yeah. But they also were hedging their bets because episode seven isn't out yet. Nobody wants to get burned, right? Now, I don't think man. anyone's going to get burned by episode seven. I think we're all going to be fine. <laughs> Uh, I know people who've seen it, including Gary Kurtz, who produced this movie, who produced Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, 
and has also seen enough of, of Seven to say, he said it's a beautiful, beautiful film, and that it's a handoff, that it's an emotional thing, that it's a, that it's a, well, I, from what I've heard from various people and connecting it all together and what I've seen, I think it's actually possibly going to be the best Star Wars film. Wow. I really do. Big order. <laughs> and that's a tall order, you know. So we could all argue about which... Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fisticuffs you want, is it? <laughs> we'll replay this after seven and be like, oh, um, uh, yeah, he said that. I, uh, at least <laughs> we're all hoping. So, yep. so, but now, and then somebody said, well, hurry up and get it all nailed and put together and we still have score to do. That's all temp score in there. We still have to license all the songs or get rid of all the songs, except I am, I said, we gotta have that. Yeah, but, because nothing says cool like Neil Diamond. But, <laughs> but we, and we have massive amounts of work to do on final visual effects, though, I, I mentioned this earlier, the cheesy sort of motion graphics effects that were not, that are just sort of there as temps. Originally, we were going to get John Knoll and other friends and relatives to, to bump them way up to ILM style uh, special effects. And then we said, well, hang on, we can't afford that, number one. But number two, whenever I would go around and tell the audience at the end in one of these Q&As that I was going to upgrade everything, all the effects, they were like, oh, don't do fit. that. Doesn't fit I mean, these are kind of the effects he could do. And I said, actually, they're much better than the <laughs> effects he could do. I know, I'll replace them all with real models on strings with firecrackers and lighter fluid and, you know, and that's what we've been slowly doing. And in fact, the first 10 minutes of the movie has a lot of that stuff, like the foreground helicopter and the, you know, all, at, turning the barbecue into the lunar module, all that stuff was, you know, that's an attempt to go back. So when you see some of those sort of cartoony looking animated stuff, uh, like when he has that, when he gets knocked down to the ground and he kind of goes on that little journey uh, into escaping his planet, that'll actually all be redone with actual physical miniatures, Fair. which will be really fun, I think. So, what else? Well, talking about those differences, um, I mean, obviously you're still, you know, a couple days ago, we're still shooting stuff and getting <laughs> things ready. So over this, this time, how many iterations has this gone through? Like, how, how much of this is different from your first cut and where you even picture it going? I, I'll put it to you this way. There's, you see those two hard drives that I ran in with <laughs> earlier that I was struggling with? They're really heavy. You know, a lot of ones and zeros because there, and because there's hundreds of iterations because we've had the time to do those iterations. None of them are too pr particularly radically different. It's just that when you have this much story to tell, in this many locations, this many characters, and these subplots, and all the stuff that, that work together to make it a pretty rich tapestry for a little independent film. And we, unlike a lot of independent films, because we had the time, and we had a great, talented, dedicated crew, we shot, I, mean, I remember a distributor said, you know, we'll, we'd pick you up, but we probably want to do some recutting. I said, and you probably don't have enough footage to do any recutting. And I went, <laughs> dude, I could cut five movies out of the footage we have, right? And it's, and it's funny, somebody who, who really fell in love with the first 10 minutes the other day said, why don't you just spin that off and do the young, <laughs> the young Patrick Johnson story? And I said, no, 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 you know, make it a wholly separate film. And I said, look, the plans, uh, at one point, a, a, a Hollywood a television executive who saw, saw the film said, this is the pilot for a phenomenal TV show. Because what happens is my character after I get to L.A. is f even crazier. Yeah, we haven't even touched on that part. In, in fact, <laughs> if, if this goes full speed ahead, I hope, you know, if it all goes the way we hope it's going to go, and I think it's going to. We, um, somebody, we were joking at first, and then we thought this might be fun. We were going to do a sequel called 52590, which is, um, it's, it's about the year leading up to the release of Spaced Invaders that takes me from being sort of amateur model maker, gotcha. script writer, filmmaker, to being, you know, having universal studio offices and working with Liam Neeson and doing Dragonheart and getting a divorce, and, but it ends like Empire. It ends with me alone and leaving, <laughs> leaving Hollywood, you know, after, in, in, in defeat and, and sadness. And then the, the third film Very was going to be um, 52504, Return of the Alumni, which is because it, this film, okay, the, the theater manager at the end of the movie, the guy who says Star Wars, you know, this isn't everywhere, that guy, that's the real Bill. That's the character Bill, my best friend, that's the real guy. Okay, the, the, the production designer in the movie is my production designer from high school. <laughs> She's a, one of my friends from high school who's a professional pro production designer now in Hollywood. Um, God, how many other, oh, okay. When the nurse who comes out, congratulations, it's a fist. Remember her? That's the real Robin who put her fist in her mouth. Wow. That's that character <laughs> grown up, all right? So, so that's why I call it Return of the Alumni because all these people that are portrayed in the movie came back to play 
older versions of themselves, or like in my, in my case, or, or, or characters that would interact with their character, and it's really a fun meta thing again. Yeah, that's awesome. So, what else? Well, so we're, obviously you're, like I said, you're still shooting this, you're still working on this, so where do you see, from the version we saw tonight, outside of some of the effects and all that, what do you see as the final version when you finish that? What do you see different in that? that uh, I see it in there? theaters everywhere. <laughs> 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 theaters everywhere! <laughs> I think, I mean, that's what I, I mean, I see it finished, that's what's going to be different. Now, I, it will be shorter a little bit. There are some interesting complications and changes in complications in what happens to him on that day. From the time, from five, from the day the sun is rising and it's 525, 77 onward, there's a lot of different routes we've been able to take and we actually have a cut that we like better that, that focuses just a touch more on the Pat Bill relationship and a little less on some of the side trips. Because they really seem to be the strongest, you know, magic in the movie is when Pat and Bill are having their back and forth. You know, yeah. there, there was a really nice rapport there. Um, uh, other than that, though, there is a big difference. And I'll try this out on you guys. You may you remember when, when he finds out that it's not Linda's first time and they have that thing, that moment in the kitchen? We actually are going to cut it off instead of her giving her sort of lovely speech about you gotta go, get out there, kid, go do it, we actually cut it off in the new cut where she says, you know, his zip code, he's here, and I'm here, and he goes, yeah, but he's not going anywhere, and that's okay with me. In fact, it's what I want. Boom, cut to the little movieola stopping with her face in it, in his room, and the music starts, and you think, holy shit, what a bitch, <laughs> she's horrible. I mean, she just dumped him like that. Instead of giving the encouragement, we treat her as, at that point, a villain. The one we should never have trusted in the first place. Bill knew, Robin knew, everybody knew, but Pat fell for it, right? Which, but what, by doing that, instead of repatriating her and making her, you know, likable again by giving him the old shove off, we make her seem a villain as he saw her in that moment. Yeah. He then goes home, cr crashes his room with a lot more vigor that way because he's a lot more pissed off. He's not just sad, he's pissed. Goes back, gets beat up by Tony, says never fuck with a Kubrick fan. You know, and, then, and then when he's beating up Tony and Tony says, we never did it, well, why would she tell me you did? Bam. Why did she tell him that? So he would go. And he finds it on his own. Right, rather than her he finds it, it out rather than sort of... I'm really good. I'm a great lady. I'm going to bring my kids and my 2.3, you know, or my, my yeah. husband and my two. It, it, it's sweet stuff. And, I, and, and it's emotional. And people actually enjoy the scene mostly. I don't know. Did you guys like that scene? Mm -hmm. It's a great scene, but I'm not sure it doesn't hurt the ending of my movie. And that happens a lot when you're editing a film. Now, we'll try it again a few times back and forth, the new way. And, and obviously, you guys reacted well to this version, but we'll try it, you know, both ways and see how that plays. Mm -hmm. I'm not a slave to testing, but I. I feel like I'm on the right track with this. Uh, yeah. I think that it's going to have a much more emotional punch when he he says, why would she tell me you did? And that's exactly it. It may not hurt it going one way or the other, but you can have a stronger moment in that and, and having him find that on his own. Then it's the a DVD day. extra, along with thousands and thousands say, of other four DVD extras. Were, <laughs> right. yeah. Well, we have a few minutes. Yeah. You like the new way? <laughs> All right, that's a vote. Anybody go. else like the new way? <laughs> Ooh, I like, okay, good, good. good. I can't. Well, I'll come back and show it to you when I've got the new way cut out and, and, and I've got a stable machine full of, you know, you <laughs> and we go. can show it full screen. I'm really sorry it was so small. Because um, it, it, it plays quite... Did you like the, the, the change in aspect, aspect ratio, ratio when it goes to Hollywood, where it goes from, like, the 185 to 235? Then. That works really well on a bigger screen. Um, no, not, not, nothing wrong with the screen. It was, our, it was my fault. Um, <laughs> but we'll bring it back. Yep. Did you have a question? You know, it's so funny. Let, let me jump right on that. Because you're so right, and, and we did shoot it, and it's going back in. In the theater, when they're arguing about, you know, we sit here waiting for trailers, and what, who cares about this thing? And, 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 and it, I think at one point, we cut away, and what we cut away from is, uh, Linda says, I thought Star Wars, or, you know, uh, he, oh, he, Pat says, it was made by this really smart guy named George Lucas, who directed American Graffiti. And... And, she, and Linda says something like, I thought American Graffiti made like a bazillion dollars. Yeah, it did, but people are afraid of George making a, a science fiction movie because they think, oh, he, he only knows how to make little, you know, homespun, you know, coming of age stories. But a good science fiction movie would only be a good science fiction movie if it's a good movie first, right? And Bill goes, wrong. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, I, and I, I can prove it. He goes, 
what's the best science fiction movie ever made, Pat? And he says, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And he goes, and what's the worst movie ever made, Pat? And he goes, and he goes 2001 A Space Odyssey. Proving my point. And they have this exchange, though, about George being this little pioneer who nobody believed his film, Star Wars, was going to work. In fact, the only person who believed was Steven. The studio didn't believe. All his other filmmaker friends didn't believe. That's why they traded uh, n- uh, profits. Because yeah, exactly. Steven's like, I'll take profits. You, you, I'll give you some. Cl- I'll give you a whole bunch of Close Encounters profits in exchange for some of this. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, he will be mentioned quite uh, laudatorily. <laughs> laudatorily. First, sorry. Yes. Questions? Yes. I think that's correct, when, and I should clarify that some of the string and puppetry stuff will be meant to be obvious, like at the very beginning when he's messing around and still figuring out how to do this. By the time it gets to him laying on his back and, 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 and sort of imagining escaping the planet, it'll be done physically, only so that it will feel like the movie was made in 1970-something, as opposed to we, went, we won't make that look cheesy, we'll make that look pretty darn good. It'll just be the, it'll be the kind of effects they're returning to, like in the new Star Wars films, where there will at least be actual physical models, but they'll be really good models uh, in those scenes. Because I agree with you, I don't want to, I don't, it, it is about what he is projecting as his vision of what he would make, and his vision of what he, I, I'm capable of making a physical version of that vision that's still far in advance of anything he could have made at the time. and then become more, absolutely. As long as it doesn't become computer graphic or anything like that, because that takes us out. That you're absolutely right, and, and I certainly, when I was doing all of those models and strings and everything, I certainly in my mind saw them as being epic and amazing, and then when I actually shot them, it was, it was awful. So there's a way with that transition of that little moviola to come in and out of stuff that's very, very, kind of brilliantly done the way Kubrick and Spielberg and Lucas would have done it, but then you see it when he rolls to a stop and it's really just a silly little model. We, there's a, like, like for example, when the lunar module is landing, that's stuff that John Knoll did for me, and that, we're, we're keeping that just as it is because it's his imagination. Now eventually you'll, at, at some point, one thing we're planning on doing is when his mom walks in, we're, we're probably going to have the lunar module that's on the surface that goes not be that beautiful CG one. It's going to be his little model that he built at the beginning of the film, re-photographed and just placed where that stand-in CG model is. But it'll still just go, you know, take off like that. But that'll be that tiny shift. You know, when she walks in, it'll sort of wipe clean the beautiful CG version and leave, leave this kind of silly version in his wake. Well, I'm glad you said that. I appreciate hearing that. Yes. <laughs> well, you'd, you'd have seen it parked out front if I wasn't so, I mean, I was literally, Kathleen Barnes, my, my girlfriend who's, who's kept me alive during all of this, um, drove down here with me literally in the back seat with disk drives, a computer, cords, an inverter that was about to melt because we were pulling so much wattage out of it. And I, I was originally, and I, I, I told uh, the, the guys that, you know, uh, that I was going to bring the Pinto down, I was going to drive it down, and, and I thought, of all the things I need right now is to be doing all of that in the backseat of the Pinto, a very dangerous place to be, it breaks down um, and, and, and it breaks down halfway there, and I'm like, everybody come up the 40 about, you know, 60 miles, and we'll just do it off the side of the road on a big bed sheet or something, you know, we'll, anyway, um, so yeah, I, drove, I drive a 1975 Ford Pinto, the, the car in the movie, that's my daily driver. Yeah. What happened, real quick, what happened was I, t- I um, what happened was when we bought the car, uh, Don Ferry, my production designer, found it in the auto trader for $750. These people did not know what they had. It had 36,000 original miles on it. It was in Texas. She, she flew down, got in the car, because we could afford to fly her down to drive it back because it only cost 750 bucks. So she drove it back. <laughs> the minute I got in, in the thing and drove it again, I was like, I, I want this. <laughs> and I paid for it personally. It wasn't the movie's budget. So... Um, so I, I sold my, my uh, Nissan and, and I drove it. I just, I, I liked it that much. And I've since driven it all over the country. I went on this Hearts of Dorkness tour. I don't know if you've read about mm. that with this crazy 
kind of test screening promotional tour back in 2012 where we were just trying out new versions of the movie. We went down to Alamo Draft House in Austin and so we screened this movie at the base of Devil's Tower on a big hand-strung screen at night under the stars. It was, you know, I mean, we went all over the country. 7,500 miles in a Ford Pinto with a giant um, uh, RV called Large Marge full of editing equipment <laughs> and a uh, camera crew and, and it was, it was a, an adventure. But, yeah, no, I, that's what I drive. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. We've got just a couple more minutes. So last, last short question or two. Anyone? Did you really leave your brother hanging? <laughs> <laughs> I remember I told you the crazier the... Yeah. Oh, no. oh I really did. Yeah, that was, that was a bad day for Pat, Patrick Reed Johnson. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got in significantly more trouble than, than is put on screen. Uh, he wasn't hurt. He, he was, well, he was emotionally hurt. And he still twitches whenever he sees silver and, and Kodak boxes. Um, but no, he, it, it, I did that, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Last one, anyone? Oh. What's your idea for the, the guy that's Oh, yeah. interesting. He does look a little like Cooper. <laughs> and that's another thing I've cut out that I'm debating putting back at K. And I don't look like it now because my, all my hair is gone. But... I have footage of me, when he knocks over the monolith, originally we cut to this big wide shot of the proceedings and you realize that the whole thing is a big painted backing and, a, and, a, and, and the, it's a set on a giant soundstage oh. in Pinewood and you see crew members and lights and the back of a chair that says Kubrick Just or, or, you know, sort of Stanley <laughs> and the guy gets up and it's me now you gotta, you gotta imagine with the hair and a lot thinner and I just stand up in this bad Stanley suit and just go you know, like that, and he's like, I can, that's when he says, I can fix this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Well, we'll, maybe when we come back, we'll show that version and see what you think. Nice. So where can we follow you? Website, social media, what can we do to keep an eye on We've this? We've actually kind of submerged a lot of that for a little while because we're in the sort of final stages of, uh, I, I don't want to tell you too much about the, the distribution and marketing plan because it's kind of really cool and fun and some of it's full of surprises. There'll be some interesting stunts. I mean, I can tell you that, that when we finally figure out a date, and there's a year's span between the earliest possible date we could release it and the last possible date we think we can release it, and there are many negotiations going on about where that's going to end up. But a couple of weeks out, or even maybe a month or two out from the release, you'll start seeing in various small towns around the country monoliths just like <laughs> in the town square you know, or on the roof of an office building, or off the side of the commuter railway, you know, and then another weekend there'll be like a phrase from the movie emblazoned on the monolith, you know, and, and you may see the dual truck driving around the southeast chasing a Pinto, <laughs> and we, but we're not going to say the title of the movie for quite some time, we're going to kind of build this yeah. sort of, like, what the hell is all this stuff, you know. Um, you know, you may see some alien people that look like the alien guy, or you may see that spaceship <laughs> crashed in a, you know, the orange spaceship that he flies maybe crashed in a field somewhere. We, there's a lot of really fun stuff going, but we got to be very careful about it. So in, to answer your question, there will be a new web presence coming up, but I wouldn't expect, I mean, you guys can all keep in touch on Facebook if you want. It's Patrick Reed Johnson, R-E-A-D. Facebook me. I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'd, I'd love to talk to any of you, you know, um, and I really, I'm not kidding, and I'll answer you, and I'd be happy to discuss things further or get your opinions or whatever, um, but in terms of a sort of an official opening up of, of any kind of information or marketing, that's going to be a, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to be closer to summer before you start seeing much of that. Okay. Well, you've got his Facebook. You can Google the name and the title here and there and look for for updates and we'll see how things go. Yeah, I'm so appreciative of you guys coming out, sitting around for an hour while I got my act together and then and watching this. And I, your response was so thrilling. I was, uh, I was, uh, I had some tears. I'm an emotional guy. Um, but I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for, for spending time with me. Thank you for bringing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome.